Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, what's your story? I'll bet you have lots of them, actually. And what are stories about? Why do we have so many stories? Why do we live a life of so many stories? Let's look at this journey we're on, why we're on it, what it all means, who are we anyway, to be here, what does it represent? How come we're not just stones <laughs> or rocks or, or clouds? So to, do, to help us understand this better is uh, a return of a, a wonderful guest that we've had recently and, and even some years ago, the author of Deep Spirit, Cracking the Noetic Code, Christian De Quincey. Christian, Welcome to Energy Stew. Hi, Peter. It's good to be back. Good to see you again. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you about these stories, because in your book, I, I read, the world is not made of atoms. It's made of stories. So what does that mean? Great question to start with. Um, by the way, um, I don't think that phrase originated with me. I remember hearing that somewhere many, many years ago, but I can't remember the source. Would you like it enough to put it in your book? <laughs> exactly. It stuck with me because it made a lot of sense. Now, I should, um, I should point out that I'm not denying that atoms exist. Of course they do. Right. Although there are some scientists who even question that because they're not empirically observable. Um, but uh, the physical world is made of atoms, but the physical world isn't the physical world as understood by modern science. In other words, it's just made up of dead, insentient matter and energy. The physical world is made up of sentient energy, energy that tingles with awareness, with feeling and intention. And so an atom isn't just a tiny lump of matter or a bundle of energy. It's a bundle of sentient energy. Every atom and the molecules that the atoms form, indeed even the subatomic particles, have their own degree of feeling of awareness. In other words, they have their own consciousness, their own sentience. Now, in, in modern cosmology, in modern science, we have the story of the universe from the Big Bang up until now. So, um, you know, and many cosmologists would agree that uh, scientific theories are forms of stories. And so the, the Big Bang and the evolution of the universe is itself a story. That's fine. But unfortunately, if we look at the story told by modern academic science and academic philosophy, their story of the universe, their story of the cosmos has no place for the storyteller. In other words, there's no way to account for the fact that there are sentient beings that create meaning and express meaning through their consciousness. So when I say the world is made of stories, not atoms, what I'm pointing to is that the world is made of ingredients, of entities that are constantly looking for and expressing meaning. That's as, right. As you I, may recall, one of the main um, uh, themes throughout Deep Spirit is intelligence seeks expression. Well, we could easily say meaning seeks expression, our stories seek expression. There's, there are variations of the same idea. So the world is made up of entities that are constantly sharing information and meaning between each other. And that's what I mean by it. the world is made of stories. Well, I think if we look at the growth of the universe, we, don't, we can't find any meaning to it until we come to sentient beings, right? Uh, self, or, or maybe as we talked in the last show, and self-conscious beings, perhaps. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I would say that. Um, I would say that um, self-reflective conscious beings can um, express and create highly complex self-referential 
stories. Right. We know, we understand meaning, whereas let's say any form of amoebic life or whatever, their meaning is to survive. It's intrinsic, yes. And, and so I, I would make a distinction between meaning and interpretation. Meaning is something that we feel. We, it's embodied. It's an embodied feeling. Interpretation is a cognitive process. And so it requires an advanced evolution, uh, evolution evolved being, excuse me, to um, engage in interpretation. You need a, a brain and a neocortex to be able to engage in interpretation. But a single cell experiences and expresses meaning, even though it doesn't cognitively interpret the world that it finds itself in. Right. So there's all kinds of activity going on. But when you get to this other state of consciousness, it's about reflecting on the activity or, you know, telling the story <laughs> and seeing the story, identifying the story rather than just being the story. That's one way to put it. Yeah. 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 So, so I would say that every sentient being throughout the cosmos is constantly expressing its own story, expressing its meaning, expressing its intelligence. But it takes advanced evolved beings to express the meaning and express the story intentionally with self-reflective awareness of what they're doing. Right. That amoebas don't do that, but, but humans and whales and dolphins and elephants and probably octopus and some other critters do as well. So how we do that is a big part of what your book, book Deep Spirit is about, is how we hold our consciousness in communicating and identifying it. Do we want to identify it through um, our left brain or our right brain, <laughs> through our um, reason or our knowing? Yeah, and one of the... Um subtext in, in that story, in, in, in the novel Deep Spirit, is that part of the problem is, is the either or thinking, that either it's intuition or it's logic and reason. In fact, it's both. Consciousness has both capacities and our task is not to jettison one in favor of the other because then we're only getting half of the picture. So what I, in, in Deep Spirit, but also in some of my other books, what I emphasize we need to do is to cultivate a kind of reason that remains connected to our embodied feeling. And so reason, is a, I make a distinction between abstract reasoning, which is what most of us are taught at in school and college, abstract reasoning. We get into our head. That's one kind of reasoning, and it can be useful for calculating things, but in terms of actual relationships with other humans and with the world around us, that kind of reasoning is very limited. What we need is another kind of reasoning, the kind of reasoning that um, I would say is common in indigenous cultures. They certainly are rational beings, but they have not lost contact with their embodied being, with their embodied feeling. And so when they speak their reason and their logic, it's an expression of their embodied feeling. And I call that grounded reasoning as contrasted with abstract reasoning. And so what really we're aiming for in, in, in the book Deep Spirit is to elevate an awareness of the difference between abstract reasoning and embodied grounded reasoning where feeling and thinking are supporting each other. They're not at odds with each other as they tend to be. Right. In, Society. And this might be how uh, this new integral philosophy is understood, because we're coming into an age of, it's called integral, so that's integrating these two aspects. Yeah, yeah, that, that is one way of um, understanding integral um, perspectives. Right. And, and the idea of integral is that both retain their own identity. And this, you may remember, is also a theme within Deep Spirit. They retain their own identity, but they do so without attempting to dominate the other. So unfortunately, for, for reasons that I go into 
I touch on in Deep Spirit, but go into in greater detail in one of my other books, Radical Knowing, is that the, um, we aren't as aware as we need to be of the difference between reason that is and language that's an expression of our embodied feeling, which is what connects us to the world around us and the separative abstract reasoning that we are trained to engage in in school and college and in business. Um, so we need to blend the two together without losing their identity. And that's, that's one of the meanings of integral. It doesn't leave anything out and it, it transitions from either or thinking to both and thinking. And I think, I think that's the war that's going on in, in, the, in politics even right now is that the, the reason why there's so much deception is the, the overuse of the abstract reason and putting everything into words uh, that are um, that can be so deceptive because they don't integrate the deeper inner core of meaning that uh, we need to hold in our hearts to be able to make the right choices. Well, right, and that brings up another point um, that the problem we see currently in, in Washington in, in politics is raises the difference between reason that is distorted by emotion and reason that is clarified by feeling. Now, let me say a little bit more what I mean by that. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> yeah. But um, if we look at what's going on in Washington, we see that people are highly emotional about their dogmas and their biases and their policies and so on. Which have so, to do with re that, that left brain reason. Well, it has, to, it has a lot to do with also emotional attachment. Right to it, yes. And, and to the degree that these people are not um, emotionally mature, um, right. their, their reason, their, their emotions distort their reasoning. And so we have people like the commander in chief, I have difficulty pronouncing his name, um, uh, who speaks incoherently and apparently thinks incoherently because he's riddled by um, suppressed emotions. And so he's very, very illogical, very, very irrational and is contaminating the, the processes around him. Now that's very different from um, somebody who is expressing their reasoning as uh, with an awareness that their reasoning is an expression of the feelings in their bodies. Intelligent feelings. And so what I want to do is to make a distinction between emotions on the one hand and feelings on the other. When I talk about feelings, I'm not talking about emotions. I'm talking the physicians in our bodies. So... Um, Say that again because the, the yeah. sound got distorted just now. Uh, okay. So an emotion is, um, is an experience or a feeling that is then cognitively interpreted. Whereas a feeling is the embodied sensation itself prior to interpretation. Right. So right. I've always understood that. And, and a lot of people don't have any idea of that distinction. Exactly. And... Um, I sometimes give an example that seems to help people get that distinction. So let's say I'm in front of an audience giving a lecture and I feel my, the palms of my hands are clammy and I'm sweating and my heart is thumping in my chest. Those are my sensations. Those are the actual feelings of thumping chest, clammy hands and so on. And then I interpret those feelings and and one way of interpreting is to say, oh, I'm anxious to be speaking in front of this audience. And so now the emotion is an emotion of anxiety or fear. But I can have exactly the same physical sensations in my body, the thumping heart, the clammy hands, and so on, and then interpret it differently, cognitively, and say, boy, am I excited to be speaking to this group. 
exactly the same sensations, but now the emotion is, is excitement rather than anxiety or fear. So our interpretations of our experiences, our feelings, are what generate and color our emotions. Right, and that can go anywhere. Yeah. And, and be very confusing. And so what we want to do is to identify and, and enhance that the sense of feelings that people have so they can work with them better. Otherwise, they get lost in the emotion. Exactly. Yeah. 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 At the, the part of certainly somatic psychotherapy, for example, focuses on increasing awareness of our embodied being. So what's going on in our bodies to pay attention to those feelings. And as we direct our awareness and attention to our actual embodied sensations, to our feelings, a kind of psychic alchemy begins to take place and, right. and things shift and, and transform. But what's very important is for people to understand the nature of consciousness as not about thinking. It's about awareness that is much more holistic in terms of our body sensations, our uh, the energies that we feel from other people, you know, and create empathy. I think that's probably the source of empathy is feelings rather than emotions. So it is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so the idea of working with consciousness, and that's your specialty. <laughs> is really understanding the whole human process. Yeah, uh, except I expand it. Um, I get very concerned when the focus is just on human consciousness. Human consciousness is just one manifestation of consciousness. All species, all sentient beings have consciousness and awareness. And so... That's why you have dolphins in your deep spirit book. <laughs> So I, I really think we, as a, as a society, as a civilization, need to rethink and minimize our tendency to focus exclusively on human concerns. I mean, it's understandable, but I think it is also blinding us from how we are related to and dependent on the rest of the world around us. Right. That's, it's creating clarity about how conscious everything else is beyond the human spirit. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. how conscious birds are and squirrels and horses. Yes, and, and, and so we, we look at most indigenous peoples and their traditions who have maintained that embodied awareness and relationship to the consciousness of the world around them, other animals and the plants and even the stones and the lakes and the rivers and the rocks and the trees and so on, they haven't lost that connection, whereas it's been um, brainwashed out of us, educated out of us in the modern Western, westernized world. Right, and your book really explains that a lot. But what's interesting is that you have the subtitle, Cracking the Noetic Co Code. And a lot of people don't understand what noetic means versus, for instance, genetic. <laughs> right, right. So I think it's important to understand that what you're relating to now, talking about all of, of life form uh, and relating to it through consciousness has to do with noetic uh, experience, right? Right, so whereas genetics um, are where the thoughts about the physiological body, our physical aspect, Noetics inform us about the quality and dynamics of our consciousness. And so um, we could say that genetics educate us, our, our genes program us for growth. Our memes, N-E-M-E-S, our noetic units, program us, our direct us for transformation. So genes program us for physiological, biological growth. Noetic means, means program us for transformation. Soul growth. 
for soul growth is one way to put it exactly yeah. yeah but soul growth has to do with that identification of the souls of all of life form like animals all have souls and what do we know about them well you know certainly pet owners know a lot about the souls of their pets right so that's one introduction to it but you know what about all the the wildlife around us and and how yeah that, complex that, that raises another really interesting um, issue um, that yes we have our own sense of identity but unless we really pay deep attention to what's going on we tend to assume that our identity is something separate and distinct from the identities of all the other people and all the other animals around us. What I'm proposing in my work, including in Deep Spirit, but also in my other more academic books, is that who we are, our identity, is formed by the entire universe around us. That in other words, our own sense of consciousness is not ours. It's just as our embodied material is borrowed from the world around us, our consciousness is borrowed from the cosmos around us as an expression of cosmic consciousness. And I think this is one of the core teachings of most psycho-spiritual traditions is that we need to let go of the sense of our own individual isolated identity and realize that who we are is not ours exclusively that it's a, it's a contribution from the, our relationships with the rest of the world around us. Right, and that gets very deep into how we hold the consciousness through our thought process, because true, pure consciousness is just being awake. And the awakeness is universal, it's whole, it's, it, it, it's, we don't know that our awakeness is separate from the awakeness of anything else that exists. But we're seeing it through our own experience right but how we interpret it then can be very self-limited yeah yeah interpretations almost by definition are limiting because they involve distinctions and separations so interpretations if you like are a form of analysis and and that leads to separation but Whereas, I, think, I think what you're trying to teach is is how to move beyond that and or at least yes. recognize beyond that yes exactly yeah yeah to realize that um who we are as individuals is generated by our relationships to all other sentient beings that we are to um, use a word that Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the buddhist uh, master uh, has used we are interbeing rather than individual beings. Oh, we don't know it because we're being conditioned to be limited. And yeah, we, we are conditioned to um, think of ourselves primarily as isolated individuals that then come into relationship with other individuals. What I'm proposing in my work is that that has it upside down. It's actually the other way around, that relationships are fundamental and our individuality is something that arises like a wave in an ocean. Our individuality is something that arises from the matrix of relationships that compose the universe. Right. So individuality is secondary. What's fundamental is our intersubjectivity, is our interconnectedness with everything around us. And it's the only way we can know anything. Uh, for instance, how, how does a table know itself? <laughs> Yeah. It has atoms that relate to each other to create a table, <laughs> at least that how, as we identify it. <laughs> right. Well, the, of course, the, the wood in the, in, in the table is um, generated by the, the, the molecules and the cells in the tree. And then humans come along and with, with a, a blueprint in their mind and they shape the wood into a chair or a table. And so the table as a table has no sense of its tableness. But the molecules and cells in the wood would have a sense of their own, um, their own wood, being. Wood, woodiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that's what I was referring to, is that right. matter is intelligent because it, it knows itself to hold itself. 
Right. And if we can understand that and then identify how we are creating ourselves all the time, <laughs> then, and see these distinctions, then we can actually free ourselves from it. Yeah, and the, the interesting phrase um, you use there is that we create ourselves. In a sense, that is true, but it may be true, I don't know exactly how you meant it, but it may be true in a, in a different way. It's not, the we is not us as individuals creating ourselves. The we is the collective. It, it helps create us by relationship. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we're getting to the end of the show. I really did go by very quick again. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that there'll be more that we can talk about in the future. So I really am glad to have these um, deep um, communications with you because I it's expanding my consciousness to, to talk with you. <laughs> Wonderful. So Christian De Quincey, and you have a website, ChristianDeQuincey.com. Correct. And it's uh, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-D-E-Q-U-I-N-C-E-Y.com. That's it. Yep. Right. Yep. And uh, that's where people can find you. And uh, also, they also have a Facebook page that, the listeners and viewers might be interested in um, if you search for Consciousness for Life on Facebook. Consciousness for Life. That's great. Well, Christian, thank you so much for being on Energy Stew again. Well, thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure, as always, having these conversations. With you. And this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at PRN.FM. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H E A R T, river.org. I'd love to hear from you and thanks so much for listening.